All right, looks like we are live. Welcome to Standing for Truth. My name is Donnie B, and I am your host and moderator for tonight's debate on evolution. I have Horazio and Dr. Kent Hoven here with me to debate the important question, can evolutionary mechanisms explain the diversity of life? Gentlemen, thank you so much for being here. And before we get into the actual debate itself, let's uh, let's kind of break the ice, get to know the uh, debaters a little bit. Horazio, it is your first time here on the Standing for Truth debate platform. Why don't we start with you? Uh, thank you so much again for being here. A little bit about yourself. And if you have a channel or anything like that, a little bit about that. Go ahead. Thanks, Donnie. Um, yeah, this is my first time, not only in this debate channel, but in any. I don't actually stream or anything. I, I live in Mexico City and I work for a consulting firm in human resources. I'm a psychologist, so I have not a lot of knowledge about all these, these topics, but I've been watching Ken Hovind's videos and debates for a little bit over a year now. And I've learned a lot about evolution and why it is true. So it's been super helpful. And during this time, I've always thought, I think this point should be brought up. I think the debaters should have poked a little bit more on this. So uh, I decided I, I, I should, you know, give it a shot and, and see how it goes. All right. Well, thank you for that introduction, Horazio. I appreciate you being willing to engage in this important topic. Uh, Kent, Kent Hoven, good to have you as well, brother. Hope you've been well. <laughs> a little bit about yourself, a little bit about Dell. Well, thank you. My name's Kent Hoven. I live in Lenox, Alabama, north of Pensacola, 70 miles. I've been to Mexico City. Horazio, you have a lot of people down there. And they're making more. There's a lot. <laughs> I loved it down there. Beautiful country you got. They talk funny, though. Uh, <clears throat> for me. But anyway, yeah, I, I, my name is Kent Hovind. I've been a Baptist preacher 48 years. I taught high school science and math for 15 years. And I defend the position that the Bible is true and evolution is the dumbest and most dangerous religion in the history of planet Earth. It didn't happen. There's no evidence at all for any animal ever producing any other kind of baby. God said they bring forth after their kind. That's all we've ever seen. That's science. Anything else is imagination. So I'm looking forward to the debate. Go ahead. All right. Well, thank you for that introduction there, uh, Dr. Hoven. I am looking forward to this debate as well. This is the 2022 Evolution Debate Challenge Series. We've done close to 40 of these now already with many more to come. Uh, Horazio, before I uh, hand it over to you for your slides, um, just to make sure that uh, you know the audio is is as good as, as can be before you, you start, it looks like there is a, some slight static Horazio, but it could oh. just be maybe your mic was slightly close to your mouth. Um, How about, is it better now? Yeah, it's, it sounds yeah. good currently, yes. Okay, okay. So it awesome. could have just been, yeah. So, But looks good now. If there's any issues, I'll let you know. I'll monitor uh, the audio. Um, for the audience sake, we're going to be doing roughly the same format we've been doing. We're going to have Horazio uh, start with. Uh, you know, an opening statement to set the foundation in terms of the points and arguments we are going to discuss for tonight. Then we're going to have uh, Kent have an equal time opening statement. Then we're just going to have a free flowing discussion uh, discussing each uh, point and topic one at a time. And then, of course, we're going to get you guys in the audience involved. We're going to have an audience uh, question and answer. Please make sure you're tagging me at Standing for Truth and that way I won't miss them. Okay, Horazio, I do see your slides here. So if you'd like me to, I can put them up on screen. All right. And you're good to go. Okay, so thank you, Donnie. And actually, thank you for suggesting this topic uh, because I think it, it reflects exactly what I've been thinking and what I've been wanting to discuss with Kent. So thank you for that. Uh, now let's see if uh, any evolutionary mechanisms can explain the diversity of life. First of all, let's talk about what's what this is not going to be about. This is not going to be about the first four stages of evolution, which are not part of the theory, but uh, Kent always tries to, to bring this up. It's not about cosmic evolution. It's not about chemical evolution, stellar or organic evolution. I think it was in the debate with Mark Reed that he said, can you give me just this? God did it. Okay, I'm going to give it to you. God did it. The, all these, um, there's no big bang. God created the universe and then the, the earth. And actually it aligns with what I learned as a Catholic, like uh, Catholics adhere to, to the theistic evolution. So that's, that's good for me. 
we're going to talk about the change in the, in, in the heritable characteristics of biological populations over successive generations, which would be what Kent would define as macroevolution and microevolution, which in my view, I don't think um, should be divided like that because they're the same thing. But okay, for the, for the sake of this discussion, let's talk about macro and micro. First of all, we would need to define the Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium, which actually I saw Kent bring up in his, in his screen. So I think we're gonna be aligned on that. What does this mean? This means when populations are in equilibrium, when evolution is not happening. Um, this principle states that genetic variation in populations will remain constant from one generation to the next in the absence of any disturbing factors. This law predicts that both genotype and allele frequencies will remain constant because they are in equilibrium, as the name says. But this has some assumptions built into it. The assumptions are that there will be random mating. There's no preference for a specific phenotype to reproduce. That there's no natural selection, that all alleles confer equal fitness, that they make organisms equally likely to survive and reproduce. There's no mutations, there's no new alleles that are generated by mutation, or any genes are duplicated or deleted or anything. It assumes a very large population that would in fact need to be effectively infinite in size, and that there's no gene flow, no migration, no nothing. No individuals nor their gametes, like pollen that is windborne, would enter or exit these said population. If all of these five uh, assumptions are met, then the population is in Hardy Weinberg equilibrium. Thing is, this is not realistic. There's always at least one of these factors that comes into play. So these are called the evolutionary mechanisms, or this is what I understand as evolutionary mechanisms. So let's talk about what drives evolution. These five evolutionary mechanisms are mutation, non-random mating, um, genetic flow, genetic drift, and natural selection, which are pretty much uh, known if you study these topics, but let's discuss a little bit more about uh, what, they, what they are. Mutation is when a certain allele suddenly uh, appears in the gene pool by any means that, that this can happen. It could be radiation, it can be just random. Um, it just happens to be there. In this example, there's this small a um, allele and then a capital A suddenly appears and then there's this new genotype. In terms of frequency, before we had that mutation, it is a one, um, the frequency is one zero, and then uh, after the mutation, it's 0 0.05 and 0 0.95, and then it starts spreading throughout the population. Then non-random mating me means that there is a preference uh, by individuals to uh, reproduce with a specific uh, phenotype. Uh, there's two types of, of mating in this way. The assortative mating, which have preference for similar genotypes or phenotypes, and the disassortative mating, which has preference for different genotypes or phenotypes. That means um, that these individuals prefer to mate with some that are alike, or that are different. And this creates also um, a change in the allele frequency. Now, genetic flow, um, the most or the easiest example would be migration when an individual from one population that has a certain allele frequency moves or migrates to another population that has a different one. And then the, the new allele starts to, um, to pr proliferate with the, with the population. The generic drift is any random um, thing that happens to the population that decreases or increases the number of individuals in that population with the specific alleles. In this example, we have these two different types of beetles that have different alleles. And then due to a, a chance event, there's only three of these beetles that leave offspring. And then the rest of the population would be only um, the ones with these with these alleles. Natural selection is uh, the most popular one, or what everyone uh, knows is that uh, there's there's some 
factors or external factors in the environment that favor or disfavor some some alleles or some phenotypes or genotypes to reproduce over time. So based on this, can evolutionary mechanisms explain the diversity of life? Of course they do, because these are the mechanisms that allow for different types of individuals and populations to be changing over time. But if I just said that and say, yeah, I won the debate, that would be cheating because we will be talking about micro and macro evolution, which I said, I do not believe that's how we should be talking, but um, that's, that's the way that this discussion should go. So a definition that I like about microevolution and macroevolution is that micro is evolution that Kent cannot deny and macro is evolution that Kent must deny. But that's not a definition that we're gonna be using for this discussion because it is not good. The definition that Kent uses is that microevolutions is variations within the same kind and macro is changing from one kind to another. I don't think these definitions work either because it implies moving from kind A, which would be the dog kind, to a kind B, which would be, for example, the cat kind. And that doesn't happen. We must remember one vital fact, that dogs produce dogs and cows produce cows all the time. Never in the history of the world has anyone seen a dog produce a non-dog. And that is something that I agree with Kent and I will always agree with him because this is true. Never, never would an individual from one kind produce a, an individual from a different kind. This is an accepted definition of microevolution and one of macroevolution. Micro meaning evolution involving small scale changes. For example, within the species or occurring a very short period of time. And this results in the formation of new species. Speciation is a thing, and this is microevolution. Macroevolution is evolution that happens on a large scale. Uh, for example, that it is at or above the level of a species, and this happens over geologic time, uh, and this results in the diversion of taxonomic groups. These definitions I took from this website, and we can later in the discussion, if Kent does not like these definitions and want to look for another one, I can I'd be more than glad to Google and search and find one definition that we both agree on, because the one that he always uses is never is nowhere to be found. He's the only one that uses it, so I I, I think we should find some common ground there. So, uh, how macroevolution works? We need to keep in mind some key words. Um, the diversion of taxonomic groups. This creates new taxonomic groups. They do not move individuals from one to another. So that means that there's no individuals that would move from one kind to another. Only taxonomic groups would be created, diverging from the original one. And that this macroevolution works at or above the species level. Species are not rigid. Um, there's uh, always uh, Kent says that species is not or is not easy be easily defined because it is not because species is a moving target. These are man-made categories, and our classification adapts adapts to the real reality of work, not, not, not the world adapts to our classification. And that's why species is not a rigid concept. It is something that man makes to understand the world. And that way we can create new species or understand at some point, this is one species and this is another one. An example of that, I would say, are these two individuals related? I think Kent would say yes, that they have a common ancestor. But how was it? Was it dog to wolf or wolf to dog? Or none of the above. Maybe it was something that was neither a dog or neither a wolf that would be named a different thing and then created these two species. And I want to go back to this point later on during the discussion because I think it is an important one. How about this? The dog, the gray wolf, the coyote, the African woolen wolf, etc. Would all of these come from a dog, a wolf, a coyote, or an individual or an animal do, that would be neither a dog, nor a wolf, nor a coyote, but something kind of in between and then diversify to all these species or individuals? 
And how about these? All of these are arcanids, and they come from a common ancestor. But what was it? It was neither a dog, nor a fox, nor a bear, not a, a specific animal that's defined here, but something or an individual that had the traits that would evolve into these species. So in conclusion, evolutionary mechanisms diversify taxonomy. New lines are created over time, and these new lines diversify in itself. We, can, we should agree that speciation occurs, that over time species split and keep diversifying, and ergo, evolutionary mechanisms can explain the diversity of life. That would be it. All right, Horazio, thank you so much for your 12-minute opening statement. I do appreciate the visuals, and we are now uh, going to hand it over to uh, Kent. Kent, whenever you're ready, brother, you've got uh, <clears throat> up 12 minutes as well. The floor is yours. Well, thank you, sir. Uh, he took his straight from the, from, from the Internet, the Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. He is correct that if we don't see anything changing, they would say it's an equilibrium. I'd say that's what we've always seen. All the allele frequencies, the genotypes, the mutations, the genetic drift, the graphs, and the Punnett squares, and all of human history will give observable, testable, scientific proof that cows always produce cows and dogs always produce dogs. Always. Okay? He says the mechanism for evolution is mutations. Well, the mutations are harmful, fatal, or neutral. The very, very few that they've claimed are helpful, like bacterial resistance to pesticide or to antibiotics and stuff like that, are actually evidence of a, of a design. They're not evidence for evolution at all. Non-random mating, gene flow, exactly the same drawings and everything that he used. Thank you uh, for having that all ready for me there, Horazio. Um, so let's see, can evolutionary mechanisms explain the diversity of life? That depends on what you mean by evolution. There are six different levels or meanings to the word. I know you guys <clears> have <throat> been very frequent in the debates in the last year or two. <clears throat> they tried to skip over the first four because it's embarrassing. That is part of the theory. What is evolving? Where did it come from? How did it get here? You don't have a complete theory. You certainly don't have reason to reject God if you can't explain the first four. And I'll cover those in just a minute. Mutations, there are mutations, but none have been shown to add information. To go from an amoeba to a human, you'd have to add a whole lot of information, like, you know, arms, legs, eyes. Where's this new information coming from? What are mutations? Mutations are random change in the sequence of base of DNA or RNA. So you don't think about the Ninja Turtle. <clears throat> mutations are essential for their theory, but they do not add any information. Oh. There are six different levels to the word evolution, and they hate it when I bring this up. And Horazo, I thank you for opening up this can of worms for the atheists. The first would have to be cosmic evolution. Where did time, space, and matter come from? If you say, we don't know, okay. Well, then quit making your theory being taught to the kids at public expense unless you have a coherent theory. Chemical evolution, <clears throat> according to the evolution religion, the Big Bang produced hydrogen, helium, and a little bit of lithium. Well, how do you get all the other elements? We cover that in my video series. Then you'd have to have the stars and planets evolve. <clears throat> Nobody's ever seen a star or a planet form. Never. You'd have to have organic evolution. How did life get started? Then macroevolution, and then microevolution. I think it's a lousy term. We shouldn't call it microevolution. It's just a variation within the kind. Evolutionary change within a species. They got to slip the word evolution in here. It has got nothing to do with it. It's a variation. Dogs, wolves, and coyotes had a common ancestor. I would agree with that. Let's see. Uh, mutations. Let me go to 976 here. <clears throat> I apologize, I've been talking so much on my tour this last week. Evolution is based on two faulty assumptions. They think mutations make something new and better. Show me an example of that. That's not science. That's SpongeBob imagination stuff, okay? They say natural selection makes it survive and take over the population. Oh, so the new improved species gets to live and all the rest of them have to die. Evolution's a religion of death. This is Adolf Hitler 101. Let's get the higher species like the blonde haired, blue eyed Norwegians and Germans and kill everybody else. That's what evolution leads to ultimately as a philosophy. So mutations certainly happen, but they're harmful, fatal, or neutral. This biology textbook says <clears throat> mutations are strictly random events 
organisms do not anticipate the future to produce mutations. Oh, I agree. Very good. Mutations are the original source of variation in populations, as shown in the many varieties of roses. I agree. There are hundreds of varieties of roses now. They're still a rose. That's not evolution. Darwin said, <clears throat> <clears throat> it's a truly wonderful fact that all animals and all plants throughout all time and space should be related to each other. This is one of the lies I cover in my textbook. They've known this for a long time. <clears throat> no matter how numerous they may be, mutations do not produce any kind of evolution. They rearrange existing information. They do not increase genetic in in complexity. There's no new information added. The textbook says mutations have many possible causes. Some mutations seem to happen spontaneously. They occur when errors are made during the replication of the DNA, like from radiation, x-rays, UV radiation, chemicals, smoking or vaping, nitrate, preservatives, barbecuing, infectious agents. I agree. There are several types of mutations. One is the type that is germline that affects the germane uh, populations. The other is somatic. Somatic. It's not going to affect anything. If you cut your leg off, it doesn't, it's not going to affect how your children are born. <clears throat> Those are different types of mutations. Chromosome alterations. All the chromosome alterations that have ever happened with uh, mutations show something is deleted, it's duplicated, so it's the same information in there twice, or it's an inverted flipped over, or it's an insertion or a translocation. It's not new information. It's a moving around or scrambling existing information. This doesn't cause anything helpful to the evolution theory. Here's a five-legged bull. There's no new information there. He already had the gene code to build a leg. It built an extra one in the wrong spot. Mutation. Now, why didn't he put a wing on there? Because bulls don't have the gene code to make a wing or a feather. So it can't add information. There's no scientific evidence to support the evolution theory except things proven wrong a long time ago. <clears throat> if real evidence exists, I'd like to see it. There's a short-legged sheep, the Ancon mutant. They capitalized in this. The farmers did, wow. So these, we can fit more of these on board the ship if we have the short-legged ones. So they've got the short-legged mutated sheep and crossbred them until they got a whole flock of them. It didn't help the sheep any. He's the first one the wolf is going to catch. Go, boys, go. Here comes the wolf. And Mutations are harmful, fatal, or neutral. Here's a two-headed turtle. That's a mutant. Not ninja, but it's mutant. And it's going to freeze first winter. Nobody makes a double neck turtle next winter. See, scrambling existing information is not going to help. You can scramble up the letters of the word Christmas and get all kinds of different words. You're never going to get Xerox, Zebra, or Queen. And you guys want to take the, ame the amoeba gene code, scramble the code, and create a human. This is absolute insanity to believe such a thing. There's a four-wing fly in a biology textbook. They talked about in this book, beneficial mutations. Here's what it said. <clears throat> Normal fruit flies have two wings. This mutant has four. This rare mutation, like most mutations, is harmful. Beneficial mutations are the raw material for natural selection. Well, excuse me, why didn't they show us a beneficial one? Why did they show a, a detrimental one? By the way, this fly can't fly. It's a crawl, it can't fly. Extra wings didn't help. Where are the examples of something that gave it a benefit? I don't know of any. So one professor said, well, people in Africa that get sickle cell anemia cannot get malaria. Oh, okay. That's a beneficial mutation. So if we cut off your feet, you can't get athlete's foot. That's beneficial. You're trading one disease for another. Some have positive effect. Allow organisms to withstand environmental factors like the peppered moth or the penguin. Look, if it's a lot of snow around and the white penguin, white penguin has a higher uh, probability of surviving, camouflage. It already had hair. It already had color for the hair. Some are already born white. It didn't add any information. It selected a slice of the pre-existing gene coat. That's all it did. Same with the moth. 40 villagers possess a point mutation which alters the protein of just one amino acid. This protein is 10 times more effective at mopping up excess cholesterol. Oh, so these guys have less heart attacks and live longer. No matter how much excess cholesterol is ingested, it can always be disposed of. All carriers of this mutation are related and have descended from one couple who arrived in Limon in 1636. 
Generally, the people of Limon live longer and show a higher resistance to heart disease. They already had a heart. They already had a me me mechanism for taking care of cholesterol. They just got to do it a little better. This isn't anything new added to the gene code. Beneficial mutations, antibiotic resistance. This is not anything new added. Some of the bacteria were already resistant. Already. The antibiotic wiped out all those that weren't, and all the, the, the tough ones survived. And now they get to make the babies for the next generation. It didn't add any information. It selected a slice of pre-existing code. If we went to some country and killed everybody under six feet tall and only let those six foot and over survive and breed, well, you do that four or five generations in a row, pretty soon you got a whole population of people over six feet tall. No question. That's not creating anything. It's selecting an existing trait. Tell you what, let's go to a country and kill everybody under 30 feet tall. How long would it take to get 30 foot population? Never. There's nobody to select from that's 30 feet tall. Biology textbooks and other chapters teach most mutations are pathologic or disease causing. But they don't apply that information to evolution. The worst diseases doctors treat today are caused by genetic mutations. Nearly 4,000 diseases are caused by mutations of DNA. The human genome contains a complete set of instructions for the production of a human being. Genome research has already exposed errors in these instructions that lead to heart disease, cancer, and neurological degeneration. These diseases are crippling, often fatal. And many of the affected pre-born infants are aborted spontaneously. They're so badly damaged they can't even survive gestation. However, biology textbooks when discussing mutation and evolution only discuss very rare positive mutation like sickle cell anemia. The fact that some 4,000 devastating genetic diseases is suppressed from publication. Why don't they want to publish that? Because it goes against the theory they're trying to push, okay? Evolution and natural, natural selection can only select. That's all it does. Creationists have no argument with natural selection. We thought of it first. It's only a conservative process that removes defective organisms. Natural selection might have a stabilizing effect. It does not promote speciation. It's not a creative force. It doesn't create a thing. Natural selection can only act on properties that already exist. It cannot create properties to, in order to meet adaptational needs. So I think there is the title of the debate. There is absolutely no scientific evidence. There's no mechanism that's going to cause evolution to happen like the textbooks say it did. They talk about uh, we're all related to a common ancestor with their family trees. You said, uh, and Horazio, that a dog will not produce a cat. I agree. But your textbooks show an amoeba producing a cat. Do you believe an amoeba over millions of generations became a cat? Yes or no? Go ahead, your turn. Okay, thank you so much there, uh, Ken, for your opening statement. I do appreciate it. That's 12 minutes for both debaters, Kent and Horazio. So let's uh, move into a more free-flowing discussion now where we can uh, engage the points and topics brought up in the opening statements. Horazio, since uh, Kent just open, uh, finished with his 12-minute opening statement, let's hand it to you to pick the first topic uh, or kind of choose where to go from here. So gentlemen, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, I think I would answer Ken's question, the last one he made. An amoeba did not create a cat. And that is uh, one of the main things that I, I have noticed throughout the debates and throughout the, the videos that the verbiage there and the wording is very important because it's deceiving. An amoeba didn't turn into a cat. That, that implies an individual amoeba turning into an individual cat. And an amoeba never turned into another thing that was not amoeba, but amoeba that had different traits. And then that amoeba with different traits created an amoeba with different traits. And that's why I started asking about the dog and the wolf. We name it amoeba, but it was just an individual, a, you know, a, a, a single cell organism that had different traits. And then those traits started changing. And it happened through a lot of time and, and through a lot of changes that that amoeba created something that we might not even call amoeba or that thing that we might not even call amoeba created something or turned into something that we would not name amoeba, but another thing that had those traits. And then as a chain, it would get to eventually after, I know Ken might uh, make fun of this, but after billions of years would turn into something that we would call it a cat. 
So if I understand what you're saying, over billions of years, with a lot of time, you said, the, I said, did the amoeba ever b b create a cat, become turn into a cat? The textbooks teach that it did. This is my objection. This family tree and trees like this are found all over the world as if it's part of a science book. This one shows a, pro a protozoa turning into a biology teacher. Yeah, it's but that's an not, oversimplification and a cartoon of it. That's not, that, that's a, a representation and a pretty bad one of that. Okay, this exact tree of life, Google tree of life, and you'll see that picture in hundreds of different books. They use that same one. This one has a single celled creature turning into a shark, a, a plant, a, a starfish, an octopus coming from a single celled organism. You do believe over millions of years and millions of changes, the amoeba turned to a cat, don't you, Horazio? No, because I think you misunderstand this representation, which is just a visual cartoon of how things happen. But you think that this protozoa suddenly gave birth to uh, an octopus or a cat or a biology teacher, and that's not what that means. That's just a visual representation. And there, there's an example uh, with Noah's Ark that I think has been brought, brought up to you, like those cartoonish uh, representations of Noah's Ark having um, the elephant being the same size as a tiger. That's not what you think happened, right? This is just a cartoon and something that might be useful for kids to understand a, a, a concept, but not exactly what you would say happened. I believe Noah had two of each kind on the ark. The Bible says 20 times in the first seven chapters, the all creatures, plants and animals would bring forth after their kind. Dogs produce dogs. That's the one you brought up. Well, I would agree. A coyote hybrid not... dog. Coyotes can breed with dogs. Uh, dogs, wolves, coyotes. 339 breeds of dogs probably had a common ancestor. God said they bring forth after their kind, after their kind, after their sort. All these are the same sort of animal. None of these are a palm tree. None of these are a strawberry. These are the same kind of animal, a dog, recognizable as a dog to a four-year-old. Dog, wolf, coyote, banana, which one looks different? Every four-year-old will get it, the banana. God said they bring forth after their kind. Your religion and evolution is nothing but a religion. Your religion teaches you that a dog and a strawberry have a common ancestor. And amoebas did slowly over billions of years Turn to a cat. Stop trying to hide it. That is exactly what it teaches. Dogs, coyotes, wolves have a common ancestor. I agree. That doesn't mean dogs, wolves, and bananas have a common ancestor like your tree shows. Let's keep it, let's keep it simple and small. You say a dog and a wolf had a common ancestor. What was it? Was it a dog or was it a wolf? Don't know. Probably they, probably they don't care what we call them. I bet they don't even care at all. Exactly. And that's the point. It was something that we probably wouldn't call a dog or a wolf, then speciation happened. And we have dog, we have wolf, we have coyote, and that's diversity of life. And how did that come about? By mutation, natural selection, genetic drift, etc. Well, coyotes and wolves can still interbreed. Coyotes and dogs can still interbreed. Coyotes and or dogs and wolves can still interbreed. Here's a co koi dog mating a male coyote with a female dog. It can still be done today. So the fact that there are three species and 40 subspecies of wolf, and they still have, they still bring forth a wolf. Wolves, there are the d -hole. There's all kinds of animals you showed on your chart, all the different dog kinds. Yes, I would, I would agree. That'd be a good field of research for biology. How far can this genetic change go? How many varieties can we get? They've got down to a toy chihuahua now. Completely useless dog. Do you think they'll ever, it's, you know, this big. Do you think they'll ever get a dog as small as a hamster? No. There are limits to the changes. There are animals as small as a hamster, like a hamster. Do you think they'll ever get a dog as big as an uh, elephant? No. There are limits. I don't know how you guys can't see it. But sure, there's variations, but they're limited. Dog, wolf, coyote, all the same family. Are they different species? Yes. I don't think they care where we classify them. Man decides to put them in a different category. Some people decide to put their screwdrivers over here and their hammers over here. Somebody else says, oh, no, screwdrivers and hammers go together. I don't care how they organize their shop. A dog, a wolf, and a coyote are the same kind of animal. 19 subspecies of coyotes. I don't think they care. 
uh, so what you've shown is an example of what anybody would call variation within the same kind. Call it microevolution if you'd like, but they're still the dog kind. So I would consent that the dog, the wolf, and the coyote had a common ancestor that looked like a dog. What they called it, I don't know, I don't care, and I don't think they care. But it had hair on the outside, had a nose on the front, had a tail on the back, had four legs with paws. It didn't have hooves. It was a obviously in the dog kind. So you want to muddy the water, muddy the water over that and say, do you, do you believe ultimately from these family trees, do you believe dogs and strawberries have a common ancestor? Just a simple yes or no. This textbook shows they do. Do you believe these pictures here are our science? Let me call it up here for you so you can see it. All right. Here. Not the way this, you define it, no. You don't believe dogs and wolves, uh, dogs and uh, strawberries. This chart no. shows dogs, strawberries, eagles, humans, bears, butterflies, every life form. Yeah, but you're misunderstanding and misrepresenting it. So that's why my answer is not in the way you are purporting, proposing it. No. Every student in the world is going to look at this and think, wow, I'm related to a strawberry. So you understand it like the way I said it, that the protozoa had a baby and was a strawberry or something like that? Do you understand it that way? Or how do you I, view I that? I think this, this textbook, t t this chart, this whole idea of family trees is, is propaganda. I think it's evil to teach this to kids. It is not science to show an, a shark coming and a, a fern and a starfish and an octopus coming from an amoeba. That's not science. You said they're always going to stay the same kind. Why didn't the amoeba stay an amoeba? Because it did. Because the the generations of amoeba, which was not amoeba, but this single-celled organism, were always the same as the previous one. Just very small changes, very small changes. There was not a point that made uh, this amoeba be something else or um, give birth to a horse. One example would be, um, when would you define that a kid becomes a teenager? There's not a specific point in time where you say, okay, it's no longer a kid, now it's a teenager or a teenager becoming an adult. It is not like that. I hope you understand that. I completely understand. I don't think you understand what you're saying. Yes, we have decided to put arbitrary borders and say when the kid turns 13, he's now a teenager. That's what the word teenager means. We have decided that people, humans, go through different stages of their life, okay? They go through the stage of infancy and then puberty, childhood and then puberty and then adulthood. It's still a human. That is not the same as these charts showing a, a, an amoeba turning into a whale. Over small changes, over small changes, slowly. This is what you're trying to say. You're trying to hide the truth, Horazio. Stop it. You think the amoeba turned to a whale, don't you? No, the way you say it, no. Okay, tell me how it happened then. How did the amoeba, is this chart telling the truth? It's got a whale on there. Did the whale it have an ancestor that was an amoeba? It is a bad representation, and that's probably why you are... Um, misunderstanding it and misrepresenting it oh, because it's not, it. It, it is not very good. But that single cell organism at some point became multicellular, which we have seen happen. And then it started accumulating different traits that would spread through different branches of that tree. It's not just one that started to, to create different things, but a little branch created uh, an, another set of branches, et cetera, et cetera. Does that make sense? Of course. No, not to anybody, including you. Okay. You believe this. This is not science. We don't observe any of this. Science is what we can observe, study, test, and demonstrate. Look up the word science in the dictionary. Seer, to know. What do we know? We know amoeba produce amoeba. We know cows produce cows. That we know. We do not know that an amoeba can turn into a cow over trillions of generations or can slowly add information. These charts are deceptive. They are lying to our kids. I resent it. That's all. If you don't have any evidence for your theory, get a new theory. But drawing a bunch of lines on paper between the different creatures is not science. And but they, there they is do this evidence. all the time in the textbook. The fact that you don't accept it doesn't make it go away. It doesn't need to go away. It doesn't exist. 
There is no evidence for anything on this chart. This chart shows a protozoa slowly becoming uh, a jellyfish, a mollusk, an insect, a human, a, a reptile, a frog. If you trace the lines back, you believe, if you believe this type of, uh, these charts, you believe you're related to a frog. Do you believe no, you're related chart, to a no. frog over billions of generations? Yes or no? Not in the way you are phrasing it, no. And that, that, that specific chart is like super, super dumbed down and it's just a cartoon of it. I, I, I don't think it represents at all what evolution mentions, but let's go back to what you were saying that it is not science because science is what we know. But at some point, science comes to something that we don't know when we find out through science and that's evolution. We found out we didn't know that we found that these evolutionary mechanisms, we understood them, we studied them, and then found the evidence through the fossil record, through, uh, like I mentioned, these experiments that make uh, single cell organisms go to multicellularity. We see speciation, and those things help us understand through time how things happened, not in, in, in the way that your cartoon shows a protozoa going to a biology teacher because that's not how it happened. Well, you said we, we, we found out through the fossil record as one of your evidences. I didn't get everything else written down quickly enough. You need to understand, Horazio, no fossil would count as evidence in, of anything. All you can prove by finding a bone in the dirt is it died. Here's a There's fossil something clam. something else that you can learn about it. You can learn that it lived and that it okay. had certain characteristics. Okay, it lived, it had certain characteristics, and it died. Could you prove it had any children that lived? Yes or no? You don't need to. You don't need to. Okay, no. you disbelieve it by faith. No, because if it is part of a population, that was a population that was being reproducing and that okay. was uh, having a certain type of characteristic. And if you find one individual with some characteristics and then in another strata, you find another organism with different characteristics, it is logical to assume that that population developed those new traits. If you find fossil clams like this and billions, trillions probably have been found, and they're in the closed position, indicating they died rapidly and were buried alive, like Noah's flood would do. And you find these in all over the world. I agree. They find these on top of Mount Everest. Okay. I would agree this is part of a population of clams. And we have hundreds, maybe even thousands in our museum here of petrified clams. I agree. Clams existed. They still exist. Okay. And they haven't changed. They're still clams. So if we find a clam somewhere else with a slight difference in characteristics, how would you know they're related? Maybe there were two types of clams. There's lots of different types of dogs. If you found a fossil Chihuahua and a fossil Great Dane, you'd say, oh, both dogs. Yeah, maybe, maybe they're related. Maybe they're not. Maybe if you find I a fossil- I don't think you would think they are both the same species, but going back to the clam, you do know or you, you interpret finding them in a specific point that they were dragged there by Noah's flood. So that's something additional that you know. It's not only that you know that they died, but you know something else, right? You interpret that information in a different way. I, I believe the evidence points toward Noah's flood, but I'm not making everybody pay to have my belief taught in the schools. You guys are making everybody pay to have your religion taught. No animal today can produce other than its kind. Amoeba today are still having babies. Why don't they do this multicellular thing or turn to a, turn to a whale again? Why should Because they don't the go fossils? from unicellular to whale. That's not how it works. The chart shows the amoeba turning to a whale? No. Yes, it does. I'll you understand you it that way. Well, That's the way the audience, you view it. The audience will understand, okay? Does this chart show, let me call it up here. Right here. Uh, come on now, All right. I've got hundreds of these. This chart shows an amoeba at the bottom and up at the top in the left corner is a whale with lines connecting them. Does that line represent science, something they know or discovered or just their belief? It does represent that, but you want to understand something differently. You want to understand that the initial individual gave birth to the final one. At some no, point. I, didn't say, I didn't say that. And that's Over your straw billions. man. That's your straw man right there. No, no. 
Horazio, I will give you billions of generations and billions of years. Do you but believe you think the amoeba over billions of generations and billions of years turned into a whale? Just yes or no? Not the way you are phrasing it, no. Well, how, you phrase it for me then. I, I've said it before. That individual um, or that population, because we're not talking about individuals, we're talking population, that population of unicellular organisms started developing different traits that would create another population of unicellular organisms that would create another population of, let's say this time, multicellular organisms. Then that population created another population and another population and so on and so forth that we have diversity of life like we see it today. But at no point that individual protozoa, amoeba, or whatever you want to call it, created or turned into a whale or a horse okay. or a dog. Let me phrase it differently. Do you believe a population of amoebas turned into a population of whales over billions of generations? That might be a better way to phrase it, yeah. Okay. That's not science. That's it your is. belief. That's what you well, believe. Well, it is not Science, science is what led us to know that or what led us to believe that or to think that's what happened. And why, why I say it, because we have reproduced that, um, that experiment going from unicellular to multicellular. We have seen in the fossil record that transition, not for every single species, but for some of them, we have seen them uh, for horses, for even dogs, even humans, we have seen that slow progression. And I know you're gonna say, yeah, it's not, uh, you can put them in a certain order, but that certain order has a logic behind it. The strata that it was found, the, um, the place in the world where it was found, the characteristics of that individual, etc., and that constructing the whole line, you don't need to see every step of it to understand that this individual or this population that had these characteristics turned into a, this one and this one and so on and so forth. It is not a linear progression. I hope you understand that. Well, two things. The textbooks do teach that all forms of life on Earth today came from a population of a, a common ancestor, which was a primitive unicellular organism. They teach all things on life, though all the whales, all the humans came from a single cell creature. You mentioned about the strata it was found in. Horazio, you believe, I suspect, that all the layers of the earth are different ages, and you, I believe you've been taught and probably suckered into believing the geologic column. I will take the position the geologic column does not exist anywhere in the world. All of the layers are the same age. And if you think the top layer is younger, I've never had an evolutionist answer this. They claim the top layer is younger. Where did it come from to be I younger? I was hoping you would bring that up. Well, is it coming from outer space? All the no. layers are the same age. And this has been answered uh, a couple of times. I hope I can phrase it better for you. Yeah. The atoms that make that strata are the same age because they were created at the same time, let's say Big Bang. But we are not measuring the age of those specific atoms. We are measuring the age of that configuration, that rock, that strata that was created. So you always say, if I shuffle a deck of cards, is the card on the uh, on the top younger? No, but it's been on the top for the last time. The one that that is on the bottom was at the top of that pile before the the last one. Does that does that answer your question better? Like they they All were right. created at the same time, but they were ordered at a different point and they were laid down at a different moment. And that's what we are measuring. Well, all the atoms to make up the deck of cards are the same age. All the cards are the same age. So are you are saying by me moving it from bottom to top, I have now made it younger? No. Uh, that's not it, what you're saying? It has been on top for less time. It's not younger in that but way. So it's still the same age. It's just, well, then how can you date the fossils you find in these layers that's, if moving it doesn't change the age of it? That's the importance of understanding that because you are measuring the time that that specific layer was laid down. You're not aging the atoms. You are aging the configuration and that strata, how it was and when it was laid down. Okay, so 
in your thinking, in your uh, understanding, your religion, you believe a, a fossil that is found in a certain layer can be assigned an age because of the age of that layer. Is that what yeah. you believe? Okay. So if you found a human bone or footprint or anything in a layer that was way down at the bottom, that would mess up your whole theory, wouldn't it? Yeah. Okay. So if there are fossils called, just Google oop art, out of place artifacts, where down in deep layers they that. find human artifacts or I've, human bones. I've done that and I've researched that and those are either hoaxes or misunderstandings. So. Okay, that I feel the same way about evolution. There, it's either hoaxes or misunderstanding. The fact is, all we see is, all over the world, petrified trees found standing up connecting these layers. If you have petrified trees standing up connecting these layers, I don't think it's logical to say the layers are different ages. Sometimes they're upside down connecting all the layers. The flood is the only explanation I can come up with for this. I didn't see it happen. But uh, there are thousands of these trees that have been found. I got pictures of a bunch of them here of the uh, trees petrified in the standing position. So I just, I don't understand how you guys can claim the top layers younger. They're all the layers are the same age, all of them. But was it laid down after the bottom ones? I think during the flood, nearly all the layers were laid down. Some layers are still being laid down today, made of but the were same they, dirt. Were they laid down first and then uh, the ones at the top were laid later on? I don't understand your question, but I think that, as I said, I think the flood made nearly all the layers in one year. And why are, aren't they being created right now in the bottom of the ocean? Like there's still uh, movement, uh, let's say uh, in the middle of an ocean at the right. very bottom, there's still uh, tides and all that. Why isn't that happening right now? Well, a mountain eroding, taking the material from a mountain with a landslide or erosion or whatever, and moving it down on top of a layer that's in the ocean, doesn't change the age of it. It's still the same dirt. It just got moved to a different location. Shuffling my cards does not change the age. Moving it from here to here doesn't make it younger. So all the layers, I think all the layers formed, in, nearly all the layers formed in Noah's flood and the petrified trees that are standing up, connecting all of them, are pretty good evidence that you've been taught something that just ain't true. It's not true to say you know the strata it was found in to determine the age of the fossil. That's not common sense, Horazio. The fossil. Why not? The, like, well, if something is buried we, deeper, doesn't that mean that it was laid down before the top layer was laid down? No. Why not? This thing, this thing that makes the layers of strata, in a matter of minutes, will make yeah. ten layers. And if something got caught in between those layers that have the, a difference in minutes, probably. Would that mean that it was laid down before the layer that is on top? Well, minutes, but to, would that that's mean? That's why I say it's... all the layers were laid down in one year during Noah's flood. That's what the Bible says. I believe that. I can't, I, I'm not asking everybody to pay to teach that. But you think the layers are different ages by millions of years. How do you explain? Even if that's true, like if they were laid down in a year, an animal that died on day one would be buried deeper than an animal that died on day 365, right? Well, the animals, the way the animals are buried and sorted would be a totally different topic. Uh, I think the animals are sorted a little bit. Here we go, slide number 1242. I think any sorting of the fossils is really best explained by their habitat. Clams are usually found at the bottom because clams are already at the bottom. That's where they live. When the flood started, they're the first ones buried. They're sorted based upon their intelligence. Clams aren't too smart. They might be sorted based upon mobility. Clams can't run very fast or based upon body density. Birds might be found on top because birds have hollow feathers and hollow bones. They can fly around till they run out of gas. They're a little smarter than a clam and they end up on top. It has nothing to do with the age. There's a much, lo much more logical explanation for why there's any sorting at all to these layers and to the fossils in the layer. Birds are probably found in similar layers because birds have similar body density. I doubt you'll find bird fossils with clam fossils. You might, but it's unlikely, and it wouldn't prove evolution. It would prove yeah, but flood. that's not that's not how they are found. That that cartoon of yours, that's not a representation, an accurate one, of how fossils are found in strata. Are most dinosaur fossils found in in the same strata? A couple of them, yeah. 
Okay. Not, not one that, strata, but different strata that, that because, are together. Could that be because reptiles have similar body density to other reptiles and might have yes, a bit different body it, density? Then, uh, it might be, but there are some sure. other individuals that would definitely have lower density that are buried deeper, like uh, those single celled organisms, for example. In your logic, well, they would float because they would have a lower body density. You mentioned about single celled organisms becoming multicellular. I think you've been taught something oh, completely no, we're going wrong. To a different topic. Well, I, I was just going back to that. Uh, plug it in right there, please. That's fine. Okay, thank you. Uh, the so the, you want to stay on the topic of the strata being different ages. Whatever you want to discuss, man. Okay, I think we've both exhausted our uh, uh, information here. There is there are petrified trees standing up, connecting the layers, indicating they're not different ages. It's common sense to say. All the layers are the same age. It is not common sense to say the top one's younger unless it's coming from outer space. It might be common sense if, and only if, we were not able to date those layers. If there was the exact same radiometric date for all of them, then it would make sense. But now you would have to explain why there is an, I'm not going to say ages, but why is there a different rate of um, radioactive elements through uh, the different strata, and that it does correlate with what we understand as age. Or maybe that's all that gets published, because that's the current state religion. That's radiometric dating. Theory. Okay, Horacio, radiometric dating was not even invented until the middle of last century, 1950s. Yeah. Okay, before that, in 1830, 120 years before that, they made up the geologic column. Way before there was radiometric dating available. Yeah, How did they date radiometric the layers dating just confirmed it. Doesn't make it a, a different. I didn't understand that. What now? Radiometric dating confirmed what was known. Oh, it confirmed it. Okay. What if you found radiometric? What if you took radioactive, or took uh, material from Mount St. Helens and they know when it erupted and carbon dated it at seven different laboratories and got seven different ages? Because Which that's one would not they how it works. If doing something wrong disproved that thing, I would have disproved math a long time ago because I, I was very bad at math. So I disproved it. Okay. Well, I taught math for 15 years. I'm pretty good at it. I think the evidence is overwhelming that radiometric dating, they only publish the dates that, that fit what they want them to say. I That's cover this in my video number seven in great detail. I'll call that up here about carbon dating. So. I think all of the dating methods, radiometric, uh, carbon-14, carbon-13, uh, potassium uh, to argon, uh, uranium to lead, uh, 208, lead to uh, 208, 206, all of those dating methods are based on some very obvious assumptions. Do you yeah. know the initial content of that material before it yeah. got buried? You can't know that. Do you know there's been no contamination? You know yeah. the current rate of decay has always been the same? In an if it was not law, the same, there would be serious implications. So if there's no, if we cannot see those implications, then it means that it was okay. always been the same. Well, I think a freshman law student in an honest court of law would completely destroy all the radiometric dating that they've done for the last 70 years. But it is not on a court of on, law. It's based on real obvious assumptions. But we courts of law are not a thing here. We're talking science, not law. Well, science is what we can observe and study and test. We observe freshly made, laid down lava layers dating back at millions of years old. Yeah, wow. and that's because something's that's wrong. not how it works. They're doing well, it wrong. wrong I, I think it was Professor Dave or uh, Forrest Balkai, I can't remember right now, that said the only ones that uh, prove radiometric dating wrong is creation is doing it wrong, getting wacky results and then saying, yeah, it doesn't work. But every serious scientific study using radiometric dating proves it to be correct. There are some that might be wrong, yes, but the majority, they are consistent. And that's why it's not only done through one method, but different ones. Well, I'll give you a few examples. When they first invented radiometric dating, the lower leg of a mammoth dated 15,000 years old, but the skin was 21,000. Yeah, and the first cars work the, one, the way they do right now. It was one of the first ones. It is only logical that it was wrong or that it was not as perfect. 
A 15,000 year difference appeared in the assessment of samples from a single sample block of peat in New Zealand. New Zealand Journal of Geology. Why would they get a 15,000 year difference from the same sample? Why would living mollusk shells be dated at 2,300 years old? Because living mollusk shells cannot be dated through those met okay. methods. They are doing it wrong and getting wacky results and then saying, yeah, it doesn't work. A freshly killed seal, carbon dated 1,300 you years old. You cannot carbon date something that just died. That's doing it wrong. They just killed it. Yeah, that's well, doing it wrong. My point is, if there are some wrong dates, how do you know the ones you're accepting are right? You because obviously those weren't there that to are observe. Wrong are, those that are wrong are result of doing the, the experiment wrong. If the experiment is done in the right way, then you can assume. And there there might be something that's wrong. Yeah, there, there might be errors. There's human error. There's a lot of things. But the great majority of those experiments give consistent dates. There might be outliers. Yes, but that doesn't mean that you have to throw out the whole the whole field of study. Well, I think you have chosen to believe that the Earth is billions of years old because you need billions of years for the amoeba to turn to a whale. You said it yourself five times tonight over billions of years or billions of generations. If we could take away the billions of years, obviously the evolution theory collapses. But radiometric dates that are wrong are very frequent. And if one is wrong, you couldn't prove all of them are right. You think the majority are right? How do you so know any of them are right? So my math test that was wrong proves all arithmetics is wrong because I did it and I made a mistake. Donnie, we are having a thunderstorm on a metal roof building. I can barely hear what's going on. Can you hear the thunder, the rain? I can't hear it on my end, but... Um... I certainly can't hear. Uh, okay, mm -hmm. back to the topic at hand, though. The evidence for... What is the mechanism that drives evolution? You think no. mutations are going to drive it. I said, I don't know of a good mutation. You went through the five stages of the Hardy-Weinberg principle. None of those show how an amoeba can turn to a whale. Because Mr. that's what, that's you straw mining that. Uh, the, the, the topic of the debate is, um, can evolutionary mechanisms explain the diversity of life? So yeah, they can explain how we got, uh, I don't know how many varieties of dogs and wolves and whatever numbers you want to throw up, but th then it does show it. I, I think that your your main issue is with macroevolution, as you would call it, but macro is just micro plus time. Well, I don't think microevolution is a good word, as I said earlier. It's variations. I don't think changing from dog, wolf, coyote from whatever the common ancestor was is still in the dog kind. God said 20 times in the first seven chapters, they will bring forth after their kind. And they do. Do you believe the Bible is wrong about that? I think the Bible is not literal. Uh, and that's what I was taught, that it is not a science book. It is not a history book. It is not meant to be taken literally. And even you don't take some passages of it literally. You, want, you interpret and you um, find different meanings in different parts of the Bible. You, for some reason, choose to literally read into Genesis. That's your choice. But that brings a lot of issues that you have to do a lot of uh, mental gymnastics to go through. I think the Bible has obvious parables and allegories. When I say I'm hungry as a horse, I think everybody on the world understands what that means. Uh, yeah. Or I slept like a rock. I mean, there are obvious metaphors in any language. That's a different story that we're not here to discuss the Bible. You think no. the me evolution can explain the diversity of life. Would you agree that a whale and a strawberry are different kinds of life? And do you think they came from a common ancestor over billions of generations? A whale and a strawberry? Not the way you phrase it, no. <laughs> okay. Gentlemen, let me jump in here real quick. Um, I would say that's probably a good place to wrap it up, unless there were some final points you wanted to go over, like the single to multi-cell, or we can save that for a five-minute concluding statement. Uh, time is flying by. We do have a ton of audience questions. So why don't we do this? Let, let's do a five-minute closing statement uh, from the both of you. That way you can wrap up your thoughts and your points. We'll take some audience questions. And again, very engaging discussion. Chat's having a lot of fun. I'm having a lot of fun as well. Easy to moderate. So Horazio, uh, since you started, let's give you the first five minutes um, 
concluding statement, then we'll do the same for Kent and kind of go from there. Horazio, whenever you're ready, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, and my concluding statement will be very simple. Um, I think it is proven that these mechanisms, um, natural selection and mutation and, and all those uh, principles that I explained at first and that we discussed briefly, are accountable for having diversity in the world. Maybe Kent won't, and I know Kent won't accept um, that they explain the different kinds of animals, but at least they explain why there's variety within those quote unquote kinds. I do believe that there is evidence throughout genetics and the fossil record and different fields of study that prove that there is a progression, a very slow one, not from individuals, but from populations that are changing that we do see now. Um, we didn't go into ring species, but that's, I think, another topic for another time. Um, I think that explains how that progression um, went from, I'm not saying simple, because it's not simple, but single uh, celled life to the um, diversity and the complexity of life that we see today. And thank you for, for having me. Thank you, Kent, for agreeing to, to this discussion. It's something that I've been wanting to do for, for a long time. I apologize because English is not my first language. I try to do my best and I've been um, a little bit nervous. This is the very first time that I do any type of debates or streamings or, or anything of the sort. So um, if there was something that I was not uh, enunciating properly, I, I apologize for that and thank you for your time well thank you for your time as well uh horazio appreciate the five minute concluding statement or up to five minutes and again thanks for being willing to engage in this important topic so uh kent we're going to hand it over to you you've got up to five minutes as well whenever you're ready the floor is yours oh thank you english is not my first language either horazio it was complete gibberish until i was about a year old maybe two years old but uh, you have your, your english is much better than my spanish so, uh, gracias, amigo. Thank you. Okay, I think what we've observed is that variations can happen, but the evolutionists will not admit they're limited. Here's an example. Cows can jump. They have rodeos where they jump cows. Okay? It's an overwhelming fact. Cows can jump. Experiments have proven this can happen. Here's a, a bull, as far as I know, has the record jumping over two six-foot fences. You can Google it. The world's highest cow jump. Six foot, okay? So do you believe if you gave your cow or bull vitamins and minerals and worked out at the gym for 50 years, he could jump over the moon? Well, no, there's a limit how high cows can jump. Amoebas can produce variations and they can have a population of amoebas that are have variations or a population of dogs or cows or anything, but they're limited. This is what the evolutionists will never admit. I accept the fact cows can jump. So that proves if given enough time, the cow could jump over the moon. This is the logic of the evolutionist. We see the variations within the dog kind, dog, wolf, coyote, okay? Therefore, dogs are related to, they came from an amoeba and are related to a strawberry. That's their logic now, over billions of generations. It's the whole population of amoebas turned to a population of strawberries. This isn't science. No science teacher. There's a limit how high cows can jump. Have they reached the limit? Is six foot the record, currently record? Can somebody go six foot one next year? I don't know, maybe, but they're not gonna jump over the moon, okay? There are limits to dogs. There are limits to cows. There are limits to everything. There are now, I think, 250. This guy says 400 breeds of cows. Might've had a common ancestor called a cow. I think the dog, wolf, and coyote had a common ancestor and it looked like a dog. So what we've seen tonight is an example of how Horazio believes by faith over billions of years, something we cannot see, obviously, that the amoeba, population of amoebas, could turn to a population of whales and cows. My whole point is, this isn't science. It's not logical to pay to teach that to kids as part of science. It is not a logical scientific deduction from the observable evidence. The observable evidence is cows produce cows. We've seen that for thousands of human years of observation, watching. They try to make different breeds. They try to crossbreed the bigger ones or the ones that give more milk or beef or whatever. They try to create new varieties. 250 recognized breeds of cows. Probably had a common ancestor. Six kinds of corn. Probably had a common ancestor called corn. 
Does that prove cows and corn are related like the book shows? The book shows cows and corn with lines connecting them to an amoeba. My whole point is evolution is a religion. It is not part of science. You guys should admit it's something you believe in because you want to believe in it because you want to exclude God. God said clearly he made everything in six days and to bring forth after their kind. Jesus said the creation of Adam was the beginning. Horazio, are you calling Jesus a liar? You're welcome to do that. But that's what you're doing by your belief. The Bible says God made it all in six days and he ought to get the glory for it. You guys are trying to keep the glory for yourself. Anyway, uh, thank you so much for having these. My throat's about gone. We're raining. I can barely hear what's going on. And I'm tired. I had to get up before breakfast. It was awful. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> Appreciate it, uh, Brother Kent. Um, okay, gentlemen, I really enjoyed that discussion. What we'll do is uh, a few questions here from the audience. Um, as usual, I've got uh, enough questions to keep us busy until tomorrow, uh, until tomorrow before breakfast. But I'll put a time limit here and we'll, we'll wrap up the debate at the hour and a half mark. So again, Horazio and Ken, thank you so much. Okay, so first question comes in for Horazio, comes in from Taylor K. Taylor, thank you for the question. And uh, she asks, since natural selection only selects from existing traits, what is your theory on how new tra uh, traits originate? Go ahead, Horazio. I don't think natural selection only selects from existing traits, but um, mutation is the, the force that, or is the process by which new traits are, um, I don't want to say created, but the, uh, the new traits that arise. And then natural selection uses uh, or enforces those traits to be passed on to the next generations. So um, I, I don't know if that answers the question, but I don't think, uh, because natural selection and mutation are two different mechanisms, but they work together to ensure that a certain trait that was created or that was a, uh, that was a horizon moves to the next generation and to the next and to the next. And probably that trait changes and evolves through time. Okay, thank you for your response, Horazio. Kent, anything you'd like to add? Yeah, I think we would agree that amoeba do not have wings, do not have eyes, do not have legs, do not have arms. There are animals alive today with all of those features. So somewhere along the line, new information had to be added according to the evolution religion. There's no evidence of this, none. You can believe it all you want. It's just, it's a fairy tale for grown-ups. is all it is. Okay, thank you, Kent. And uh, Horazio, the question was for you. So typically what we do here on Staying for Truth is whoever the question was for, we'll give them the last word. So you can have the last word. Yeah, I think we see not uh, something that is in the process of becoming an eye, for example, but we do see today some uh, rudimentary eyes like um, the one that lizards have on top of their heads that are just um, uh, photosensitive cells and all that. So we do see those those stages, if you will, of different traits. So that's where evidence comes. And we can see those traits um, changing in the fossil record. Okay, thank you uh, for that final word there, Horazio. Next question for Kent. We've got a solid mix uh, tonight of questions for the both of you. So this one comes in from Atheist Jr. Question for Kent. He says, you said clams are found at the bottom of the layers because they were already there when the flood happens. But you also say that clams have been found on Mount Everest. Which is it? I had to get my globe. People come in here and move stuff around. All right. Atheist Jr., I'm ready for our debate anytime, son. Call it, call Donnie, <laughs> save his number, write him down. He's real brave behind a keyboard. I'll take him on this full debate right on your channel, okay? Many times as you want, AJ, as many times as you want. There is no evidence whatsoever for evolution. And there's only two sexes, okay? Are there two sexes of cows or three or four or five? That's another story. I'd like to get into that with him sometime. Okay, uh, let's see. The... The clams are generally found at the bottom of the, of the layers because they're already at the bottom when they, when they, that's where they live. However, at the end of the flood, Psalm 104 talks about the mountains arose, the valleys sank down. I think the crust of the earth was all broken up during the flood when the fountains of the deep broke open. I think the crust of the earth is still broken up with fault lines all over the place. Hayward Fault, New Madrid Fault, San Andreas Fault. There are cracks all over the place. Some are still moving. I agree. 
Some are striking a slip fault, strike fault, some are slipping up, some are slipping down, sideways, etc. I think Mount Everest, which is right here, uh, Mount Everest arose and the whole Himalaya mountain range lifted up at the end of the flood and the water rushed off. Apparently it washed off the top layers. We ended up with the bottom layers being on top. But it is true, the whole top of Mount Everest is covered in clams that are closed, petrified closed clams. You explain that, AJ. How do you get with your evolution a clam on top of Mount Everest? Does well, Mount Everest rose slowly? It'll work just the same if it rises fast, you know. So I, I, th I think uh, the Bible says the scoffers are willingly ignorant of the creation and the flood. That flood in the book of Genesis about Noah's flood angers the atheist because that proves God has authority to judge his creation. And he's going to judge it again. And you too, AJ. I'm trying to help you. You don't want to listen. Okay. I'm trying to stop you from going over a cliff. But if you want to go, I'll, okay. Go ahead. All right. Thank you for that response there, Kent. And uh, Horazio, if you'd like to add anything, go ahead. Um, yeah, just that Kent basically made the point for, for evolution by saying that um, Mount Everest rose slowly because we do see it today happen. We do see um, tectonic movement and we do see uh, mountains being created very slowly. So that that's the way things things went. I don't think um, Noah's flood is real and not because I, I fear that judgment, but because it doesn't make sense to um, either there's no evidence for it and um, it would make that God that's supposed to be loving and and understanding that would make it a very big tyrant. So it makes sense. Okay, okay. thank you. Yep, go ahead, Ken. When I was in Mexico City, I saw cars moving along very slowly because of the traffic jam. That proves cars have always moved slowly in the whole country of Mexico. Doesn't it? Traffic jams, yeah. Oh. <laughs> Sure, mountains are rising slowly today. Some are rising faster. Mount St. Helens went up pretty fast. So I think we see That's a variety a of, of but to see the mountains rising today and assume it's always been that way for a long time is not logical science. Ma major catastrophes, an earthquake can greatly upset things in a hurry. A landslide can really change things. Uh, that doesn't so I think there are plate tectonics. I think the plates are moving. They're crashing into each other. Some are going up, some are going down. But I think most of that, the major changes happened at the end of the flood. And now we're seeing little minor uh, tweaks happening to it as the earth settles in. Go ahead. All right. Thank All you, right. Kent. We'll give you the last word on that one. And next question comes in from anthony and this is a question for you horazio so anthony is asking where are all the bodies of the fossilized transitional forms with such diversity of life shouldn't the layers be filled with all the forms of life on earth go ahead not really and that is something that kent uh, has said in the past millions of animals die every day but very few fossilized and Sometimes it might happen that none do. So that's why the geologic column and, and the fossil record is incomplete because fossilization is a rare event. It's not something that happens on every single creature or in every, every single species. So that's why there's gaps. In the rare occasion when a fossil is created by a local flood, doesn't have to be a global flood. There might be a, a, a local flood or a volcano eruption or any other mechanism. Then we are lucky enough to have that specific individual from that specific population and we can analyze that. Okay, thank you, Horazio. Uh, Kent, over to you if there's anything you'd like to add. Okay, there is no such thing as a fossil record. There is no such thing as a geologic column. There are no transitional fossils. And finding any fossil would still not be any help for the evolution theory. Why don't they do it today? Where is the animal today that is transitioning to something else? I'd like to see it. I want to watch it happen. Let's get an animal with a short generation time, like an amoeba, for instance. They get, get born, grow up, get married in eight hours. We ought to be able to see thousands of generations in one observable lifetime. Turn the amoeba to something other than amoeba where we can watch it happen. That would be science. Go ahead. It's been done. Word. It's been done with that algae that went from unicellular to multicellular. It's been done with um, 
different bacteria. I can't remember the, the names right now, but we do see it happen. And transitional, we are all, every single animal is transitioning towards something because populations are not in Hardy-Weinberg uh, equilibrium. Populations are changing. So by definition, everything is transitional. Okay, thank you. Moving on to the next question. This is now one for Kent. So it comes in from uh, Andrew Schlace. Thank you so much for your question, Andrew. And he asks, uh, Kent Hoven, did layers not exist before the flood? What was the earth made of before that? Well, that's a good question. I don't think there's any way to know. The flood rearranged everything, but I think God made the world to be inhabited. It says in Isaiah that the world was created to be inhabited. I think the world we see today is 70% underwater. A whole bunch more under ice, a bunch more under deserts. 3% of the earth is habitable for mankind. So I think what Adam and Eve would have seen is very different. Probably nice, rich topsoil over most of the planet where they, everything would grow fast. No, I do not think there were any sedimentary layers created be, uh, in the creation. I think all the sedimentary layers were created uh, at the flood. All right, thank you, Kent, for that response. Uh, Horazio, anything you'd like to add? Um, no, I don't think I have much to say because I don't think there was a global flood. So, Okay, let's move on to the next question here that comes in from, um, I had it right here, questions, okay. Uh, George Bond, thank you so much for the support and the question comes in the form of a super chat and it is for you, Horazio. So uh, George asks, the protozoa genome has a 670 billion base pair 200 times the size of human genome at 3 billion base pair. If the protozoa evolved from an ancient species, why is it still a protozoa with 670 billion base pair? That's something that probably a geneticist would be um, able to answer better than myself, but I would say, and I'm, uh, I, I repeat the thing that I don't have a lot of knowledge about this, but I would say, I don't think the number of base pairs um, matters. It could be, uh, I know there's uh, not protozoa, but other um, other creatures or other organisms that have more or have less um, base pairs that doesn't make it more or less complex. It just makes it different. So I don't think it would be uh, an issue for protozoa to have 670 billion base pairs that's what it needs to make protozoa. Thank you. Uh, Kent, if there's anything you'd like to add. Well, I think God did stuff like that just to make fun of the evolution theory on Judgment Day. All right. Appreciate it. Horazio, quick final word. I'll get to this. Yeah. Uh, uh, no, uh, that would be blasphemy what I'm thinking right now. So I don't think this is the right place to do it. All right. Here's, um, let me see which... Uh, question could i put up here um okay question four um horazio i'm trying to get it up on screen we got a ton here okay so this one comes in from tanya brown question for horazio when have we ever seen a single celled organism evolve into a multicellular uh, one um, there's this experiment with algae. I can't remember the name. If you give me a second, I can I can Google for it. Uh, I can Google it for you. Um, but there's an experiment, and I think in in a debate with Mark Reed, he brought it up. I've seen it come up in in different um, in different debates with with uh, Kent, but I, I can't remember the name of it. But there's there's experiments. Um, that, that's been done around that. Uh, here it is, the novel origins of multicellularity in response to predation. Um, yeah, it, it is here. I can, I can see the link to the paper. It's from nature.com. Okay, thank you, Horazio, for your response. Kent, over, the, over to you if there's anything you'd like to add. The answer is absolutely not. We have seen single-celled organisms band together to fight against a predator. The colony is when it does an army, a bunch of soldiers join together, do they become one giant body? No, they're still individual soldiers. Nobody has ever seen what the Horazio is talking about, 
single cell becoming multicellular. We've seen colonies to resist a uh, enemy that's come in, like raising up an army, but that's all we've ever seen. No, the answer is no, it ha doesn't happen. It's imagination. Thank you very much. Kent, uh, Horazio, quick final word. Yeah, um, I, I think that's just uh, a misunderstanding. I don't know if, Kent, you, you have read the article or the paper. I read part of it. Uh, it is way too advanced for me. So I trust the experts when they say that it is multicellularity. I trust them. And that's why I, I, I trust that it is true multicellularity. All right. Uh, as we come up to the hour and a half mark, we've got time for one, maybe two more questions. So here's um, as we start to wind it down. This is a question for both of you. So this one comes in from T Rock, and um, he asks: If a tadpole can turn into a frog in one lifetime, can't a population of big cats? I think he's referring to on the ark, maybe an ark archetype of a felid, become many populations of big small and medium cats in a few thousand years. Uh, Horazio, if you'd like to start, go ahead. Yeah, they could, they, 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 that could happen. And we have seen it happen, maybe not in a few thousand years, but that's that's what definitely happened. Like a, a cat-like creature or a population of cat-like creatures generated different types of populations. The problem is if you wanna base that on Noah's flood, then there's just two individuals and that doesn't have the um, genetic diversity that's needed for um, those processes to happen. If you want to go um, with a huge population, I, I, I've heard about the rules of fives and that works for humans that you would need 5,000 individuals to uh, create the genetic diversity that we see today. I think something similar would be um, needed for cats. So I don't think that two or seven or the number of individuals that would fit within the the arc would be enough to to do to do this. Okay, thank you very much, Horazio. Over to you, Kent. Well, a tadpole turning to a frog is not uh, that. That's following a clear code. This is designed to do that. It's like a factory taking iron and putting it together, making a frame, adding an engine, adding a body, turning it into a car. The tadpole to frog is not any part of evolution. That's an amazing design. But as far as the population of cats, I don't know how many cats Noah had on the ark. I'll ask him when I get to heaven. I'll watch the video or DVD or whatever they got up there. But I think uh, the cats all coming from a cat is a pretty minor change compared to what Horazio believed. Horazio believes all the cats in the world came from an amoeba. I'm sorry, a population of cats came from a population of amoebas over billions of years, of course. That's what is ludicrous, silly to believe such a thing. All right. Well, thank you for the responses from the both of you. We're now going to our final question for tonight's awesome debate. I've had a lot of fun tonight and I really enjoyed this. So um, question comes in from it comes in the form of a super chat and it comes in from Vans 182 Workshop. It is for you, Horazio. And he asks, or uh, maybe it's more of a statement. Let me see. For Horazio, Kent is not saying that an amoeba turned into a cat in one generation. He is saying that you guys think uh, it did it over lots of time. Horazio, what, what are your thoughts on that? Uh, I'm going to repeat what I said. It's, it's all about the wording. An amoeba didn't turn into a cat. That, that, that's the thing. And that's where I think the misunderstanding comes from. There's populations that change, and this population gave rise to this other population and this other population, and then things start to, to diversify. I think that exactly what Kent is showing, that's an oversimplification and a r ridiculous um, cartoon of the theory. It's, uh, and I, I think I didn't, um, I was not able to explain properly earlier when I mentioned those cartoons about the um, Noah's Ark, that it's just a cartoon that's made to, to for kids to understand a, a bigger point. If you go deep and if you really study a subject and you go into um, detail, then you would know and you would see that that tree of life is 
really stupid and really dumbed down because that's not how things work. You would need to go to that. Uh, I, I think there's a project, the, the online tree of life with all the different branches that we know and that we have seen in the near past. And that, that makes much much more sense but if you want to lay out and and graphically represent the whole process there the, there's no definitely no way to do it it it, it would it, it would be huge and no what nobody would understand that okay appreciate the response kent over to you i agree nobody understands it it doesn't happen it's imagination it's fairy tale world the books do show and i've got hundreds of them beside me here the books do show humans, birds, reptiles, ladybugs, and pine trees, and worms coming from a single-celled creature. That's what they're showing the kids. That's my objection. This isn't science. No, we do not see any of this evolution theory. It's imagination, which is great. You and SpongeBob go someplace and have fun, but that's not science. That's my whole point in my whole ministry is to say, look, the scientific evidence says all we've ever seen is cats produce cats and dogs produce dogs. It looks like maybe they might have been made that way. I think God did it. I think he ought to get the glory for his creation. Thank you. All right, Kent, thank you for that response. Uh, this is the final question of the night. Horazio, it was for you. So you can have a, a quick final word. Yeah, um, I don't think there's much more to say rather than those charts are oh. not an accurate representation of things. All right, gentlemen, that uh, that concludes the audience a Q&A. Uh, again, this has been a, a great debate. That's another one in the books for the uh, 2022 Evolution Debate Challenge Series. Horazio, I uh, appreciate you being being willing to uh, engage in this important topic. Uh, final thoughts, final words. Again, Horazio, thank you so much. Uh, go ahead. No, uh, I just want to thank everyone for your time and, and, and for listening to me. And I I didn't expect to change anyone's minds here. I just wanted to do it because I think it's fun. Uh, I think I need to reevaluate my definition of fun, but I wanted to do it. And I think with this, I can, I can, um, I can check something in my bucket list that was debating Kent. So thank you, Kent, for doing this. Okay, thank you for those final thoughts, final words, Horazio. Uh, Kent, over to you, brother. Final words, final thoughts. Thanks for doing this. Well, thank you for doing this, Horacio. It's hard to find opponents these days. Uh, thank you. Come up and visit Dinosaur Adventureland in Lenox, Alabama. It's free. We'll give you tour, show you around our real science center where we teach science, uh, not yeah, evolution. Airfare from so, Mexico City, I don't think it's free. <laughs> it's all free. We'll put you up, feed you, house you. After about two days, we'll give you a hammer and put you to work, okay? But uh, you guys that live here and work here, it's great. It's awesome here. We'd love to have you. Anyway, thank you for doing this, and I stand my case. I believe the Bible is true. God made everything in six days. That's the only way it works symbiotic relationships by the millions are out there. It doesn't work any other way. So God did it in six days. He destroyed it with a flood. He's coming again. It's going to be another, going to destroy it again. The battle of Armageddon. Better get ready for that. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Kent. Thanks again, uh, Horazio. And to the audience, thank you so much for tuning in and being so engaged in the live chat in this uh, debate on evolution. I'm going to let the debaters uh, get out of here for the night. They've earned themselves some rest, and I'll stick around for a couple minutes going over some announcements and reminders. God bless all. All right, there we go. Uh, as I said, another one in the books in terms of just debates on standing for truth. This was our, uh, we've now hosted 215 debates on all sorts of topics. And uh, this was another debate in the Evolution Debate Challenge series. So I've also scheduled uh, several more for uh, September and October. So if you are interested in debating the topic of evolution, then please uh, make sure to send me an email and uh, I'll do my best to fit you into the busy schedule. Uh, we just finished another week-long debate marathon. So we had five debates last week. Uh, last week was a ton of fun, and we had debates on all sorts of topics. So we had one, uh, a couple on creation evolution. I debated um, endogenous retroviruses with Luca Medugno. We had a debate... Um, 
soteriology debate, Charles Jennings versus Merritt. If you haven't yet seen that one, please do uh, check it out. And we also had a debate on Bible translations. So five debates last week. We've got another four this week. It all started with uh, this debate tonight, which uh, was a ton of fun. You know, I really enjoyed this one. Easy to moderate and just a really, really solid, uh, free-flowing uh, discussion between Horazio and Kent. Lots of great questions, lots of great uh, points uh, that they discussed. So this was definitely a, a rewatchable debate. Uh, the 300th debate for Kent's coming up. Uh, Dr. Dino, Dr. Jay Bundy, Evolution on Trial. This is coming up, I believe, on the 29th. Uh, just make sure to check the events section um, because I've got events scheduled um, even into October. So if you're not yet subscribed, but you want reminders in terms of all the upcoming events, and this includes debates, our conference coming up from the 5th to the 9th. We've got between eight and nine shows that week. So that's going to be a busy week. It is all going to uh, conclude with an evolution debate on the 9th. Uh, but we are going to be having lots of presentations, audience Q&A, interaction, discussion. Uh, that's going to be fun. So again, this one is, uh, this is a much anticipated debate. This is going to be a solid uh, debate number 300. So again, that is going to be on the 29th. I also just booked uh, Ken Hoven and Mark Siegel for next month. The geologic column and the fossil record is, uh, or I should say, are the lines of evidence Mark's going to be looking to and uh, Mark and Kent are going to be debating. Uh, we're also working out some details to get Mark, who's trained in geology, and uh, Professor David McQueen, our team geologist, uh, to debate sometime at the end of at the end of September. So again, this week, we've got another four debates for you. So we've got this one coming up. Uh, I believe this one's either Thursday or Friday. Matt Slick, Stanley Terry, was Jesus fully God and fully man during his earthly ministry? Um, so that one's coming up. We've got another soteriology one. We've got the round two between Charles Jennings and David Preston, the great James II debate. This is going to be, this one's going to be epic. I'm pumped for this one. So, um, and then we've got another Bible translation debate for you. So is the King James Bible the only infallible source and norm for theology? So two um, well-informed individuals, Will Kenny and uh, Mark Gageton. Um, this one is coming up in, in just a couple days as a matter of fact. So, and then we got some main events into October. So I've just confirmed uh, final details in terms of um, some soteriology debates, uh, free grace versus lordship. And um, I should have those up and scheduled on the channel in the next few days as I organize all final details and get thumbnails going. So this one's coming up in October. Uh, Dr. Robertson, Janice, Steve Christie, Protestant versus Catholic, the Marian dogmas debate. This will be the first time that we um, host a debate on this very specific topic. So I am pumped. We've also got an end times theology debate coming up next month, September 14th. So end times theology, the rapture, pre-trib versus post-trib slash pre-wrath, J.D. Morin and myself. So I'm pumped for this. I'm doing a lot of study into this topic. And then after this debate, I've got a few on creation, evolution, ancestry, endogenous retroviruses that I'll be uh, working on scheduling. So, uh, you know, keep them busy. We've got a lot of content for you. We are uh, putting out full-time content. And um, if you want to help keep us going full time, you want to help support the ministry, you can support us through Patreon. You can support us over our, um, Bluey saw your comment. I appreciate that. You can support us over uh, just our, our uh, store where you can get all our books. Um, I'm hoping in the next few weeks, I've got the special creation updated, expanded, revived, pretty much going to be a whole new book, 200 plus pages, fully up to date on all of your um, you know, lines of evidence for special creation. I engage, um, you know, the common criticisms, objections in it. So I'm hoping in the next few weeks, I'm balancing that and then the eschatology topic. Um, so hopefully in the next few weeks, I'll have that out. I've already got the cover done, which uh, Benjamin as well, uh, as always did a fantastic job. So that's coming up. Um, 
logical, plausible, probable. The after show king looks like he's got another epic after show. We'll start right after the debate ends. And he says, come share your thoughts on who won, lost, best comebacks, and best zingers. I do believe I will be out for that epic after show for sure. Uh, Doki Doki Bible Club, support SFT Ministries, much appreciated. You could also support us through our website, Standing for Truth Ministries. Dot com. So lots to look forward to, guys. We got some big plans for 2023 as well. And um, this has really been the summer of all debates. Hard to believe that the summer is coming to an end. But if you are new to the channel, uh, you know, please share around this content. Have your friends and family uh, subscribe. We're close to hitting 11,000 subscribers. And it is all thanks to our amazing supporters and subscribers. You guys are the life and blood of this of this ministry. So uh, sometime within the next uh, 30 minutes to an hour, LPP will be live for his after show. And uh, so please head on over there. Logical, plausible, probable. He uh, hosts a lot of after shows for our uh, debates here, especially the debates on evolution. So uh, make sure to subscribe to him so you can get uh, notified whenever he is live with either an after show or any of his uh, other shows. So that being said, guys, thank you. Uh, thank you so much. I do see uh, questions coming in. Yes. If you're interested in a debate, uh, please, uh, whatever topic it is, soteriology, creation, evolution, endogenous retroviruses with myself, um, eschatology, or you specifically want to take the evolution debate challenge series with, uh, with Kent, then please uh, shoot me an email. And again, I will do my best to uh, uh, fill you into the schedule. And yes, we are. Um, I am currently scheduling uh, debates into uh, October, November, December. So, um, okay. I think that's, I think that's pretty much it guys. Thank you uh, for tuning in. This was another uh, evolution debate challenge debate for the evolution debate challenge series. And I really, really enjoyed this one. So I do want to uh, thank Horazio. And I do also want to thank uh, Kent Hoven for uh, coming out tonight and giving us a debate to remember. With that being said, uh, Standing for Truth is out. God bless everybody. Mm -hmm.